I'm going to talk about a director you might have heard of, Christopher Nolan. Now, although you may be familiar with Nolan's bigger budget studio films, the ones shot in anamorphic 35mm, 65mm, and IMAX film stocks, you may not be aware of his directorial debut, a gritty film noir shot on black and white 16mm, Following. Following is a story of a writer who stalks people during the day to find character and story inspiration. One day he follows a man, Cobb, who picks up on the fact that the young man is following him. Cobb invites the young man to join him in a burglary and slowly sucks him into a tropic convoluted noir plot, complete with a compelling femme fatale character. Oh, we used to go at each other, but that's been over for a long time. So why'd you show me you, is it? To get rid of you. Although the movie is excellent and still stands as one of my favorite Nolan films, the real credit to the film is that Nolan made the movie for just an estimated 6,000 pounds. You heard that right, 6,000 pounds, which would have been about 9,900 American dollars in 1998, and adjusted for inflation, 15,130 American dollars in 2018. So considering that Nolan made this movie in 1998, when digital cinematography was not a viable option, not that Nolan has ever shot any of his feature films in a digital format. Film uh, will always have this wonderful richness, the analog color, it has the superior resolution. How could he have even finished the film? First off, let's break down the cost of film. A 400 foot roll of black and white 16 millimeter film costs $148. This is what it costs in 2018, but we'll just assume he's making it for $15,130 today. 400 feet nets you 11 minutes of shooting. On top of the $148 to buy and shoot the film, there are necessary post-production costs, processing, dailies, work prints, and finally a negative cut of the film. Processing for 16 millimeter, according to CineLab, is anywhere between 17 cents to 45 cents a foot, which is anywhere between $68 and $180 per roll. So saying he went on the lower end of costs, that's still $216 per 11 minutes of shooting. Considering following's 70 minute runtime, he would have had to buy six 400 foot rolls of film and two 100 foot rolls of film, which adds up to $1,418. That's if he only shot one take of everything he needed and didn't cut anything out, which almost never happens in film. To cut costs, Nolan edited the film on tape. Once following played in the festival circuit, he secured extra funds to make a negative cut of the film as well as pay for an optical track. So now we've gone into the details of the cost of 16 millimeter film. We can presume that Nolan dedicated much of his budget to the film and processing meaning that everything else in the film he needed to obtain for either free or cheap. It also means that he had to be economical with his shooting style. He not only couldn't afford many takes, he couldn't even afford to shoot traditional coverage. When shooting a scene for a movie, typically you shoot a master and then move in for close-ups and medium shots of the actors. You might throw in a few inserts as well. Christopher Nolan used many insert shots in the film, as they were the easiest to light. With all of these shots, you start from the beginning of the scene and then put the scene together in post-production. Nolan, working with extremely limited amount of film stock, couldn't approach filming scenes in this fashion. Instead, he would map out how the final edit of the scene would look and only shoot what he deemed necessary for the final cut of the film. Nolan used his university's Airy BL 16mm camera rather than renting a camera from a rental house. Since he was the president of the film society, he could use the extent of the society's resources for his movie. In fact, the society had a small studio space in which Nolan shot the police interrogation scene that bookends the film. In that studio space, they had access to many lights and clean audio. It also allowed for the character of the young man to narrate the film in classic noir style. Nolan's thinking would be that if he began and ended the film with professional looking and sounding scenes, People would chalk up the rest of the film, shot in a more documentary style, to just being a stylistic choice. According to Nolan, for the rest of the film they had three lights max, so they took advantage of practical lights, which are normal lights that you see in the film, in daylight. Often he stages actors by large windows using the sun as a key light. The upside to shooting on black and white film 
is that he didn't need to worry about color temperatures and the black and white gave it a much needed expressionistic style. Further reducing costs, Nolan and company shot on locations they could get for free. Their own flats, parts of their university, and even Christopher Nolan's parents' home. They also shot with Bolex wind-up cameras in the streets in order to circumvent the permit system. You'll also notice many rooftop scenes in the film, as he only needed the building owner's permission to film on rooftops. But it provided a nice cityscape backdrop for the scenes, as well as just being an easier space in which to film exteriors. Indie productions such as these often suffer from multiple sound problems. Nolan had the whole film recorded on a Sennheiser shotgun microphone. He didn't have access to lav mics, and ADR, or automatic dialogue replacement, was way too expensive for his production. So, Nolan would shoot what he would call dry takes of scenes. A dry take was performing the scene exactly how they previously performed it for the camera, but without recording with the camera. These takes allowed the mic to get closer to the actors and pick up cleaner audio. It's kind of like a cheap way to get ADR on set. Nolan stated that he would go on to use this same technique in his later, higher budget films. Most film noirs feature plenty of guns. However, Nolan knew that it was nigh impossible to realistically portray gun violence in a no-budget feature. Instead, he opted for a cheap rubber hammer. It needed no post effects to seem realistic and added a visceral impact to the scenes in which it was used. Think about it in terms of another film. Would this scene from Old Boy be as famous as it is had Dae Su used a machine gun? Nolan shot this with his friends. Since the film was a friends and family affair, they could shoot on weekends so that everybody could keep their regular jobs and afford to work on set. He had previously worked with Jeremy Theobald on his short film Doodlebug, so he already had a much needed working relationship with his lead actor. His other lead actor, Alex Ha, who portrayed the character Cobb, was a theater actor, but wouldn't become a professional actor after this movie. Instead, he became an architect. So there might be a connection between Inception and following, as the actor who portrayed Cobb became an architect, much like how the main character of Inception, named Cobb, is the architect of the dreams. Even with a measly 6,000 pound budget, Following shines and stands confident alongside Nolan's other work. It might not be a 70mm IMAX epic, but it's a good movie and it deserves a viewing from anyone who calls themselves fans of Christopher Nolan. And one last thing before you go. In one scene, there is a Batman symbol that is prominently displayed. Now, this was probably accidental, but one can't help but speculate. Thank you for watching and don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.